this morning, uh, I would love to share a, a really simple message which I felt like the Lord just laid upon my heart. And it's about loving the presence of God. Loving the presence of God. So before I begin, let me just pray. Father, I thank you for just that wonderful opportunity to be here to share your heart with your people. God, I ask above all, Lord, that they would hear your heart. They would catch what the Spirit is saying. God, let him who has ears, let him hear. Lord, let our hearts be inclined to the heavens, heavenlies now. We, we remove every form of distraction. God, and, and, and we pray your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So something on my heart to share this morning, um, you know, it's, it's about loving the presence of God. And you know, loving the presence of God, loving Jesus, it's a simple daily overflow of our relationship with God. And I think sometimes that as we, you know, get older in the faith, so to speak, as we journey in our faith together, we sometimes can forget to practice the daily simple practices. You know, last night, uh, Nigel was sharing a little bit about the history of the church and I thought it was really beautiful uh, how, how the Lord has actually blessed this church to what it is today. And, you know, regardless of where we've come from, I feel like the Lord is always reminding us to come back to our first love. Amen? You know, when the Bible talks about the presence of God, um, the word used in the original language, most of the time, if you, if you see the translation, uh, it, it actually literally just means face. So presence is translated from the word face. Right? So when we say the presence of God, we're actually saying the face of God. Like, like Lord, I, 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 I want to encounter the presence of God. Is that we actually want to encounter the face of God. We're coming face to face with the living God. It means that there is a closeness when we come face to face with a person. It's like having FaceTime. You know, uh, I know young people these days, I just learned that the new, uh, is it called Gen Z's? The youngest generation, the Gen Z's, uh, they, they absolutely hate FaceTime or even taking up calls, right? <laughs> Everything is done through text. You know, they don't like answering calls. Um, you know, about two years ago, and we all went through this together during COVID, right? We could only see each other through Zoom, right? The only interaction, the hum only uh, social interaction we, we mostly had was over Zoom. We saw each other through the screen. But, you know, we, if we were to admit, there's something just so different about meeting together physically face-to-face, -face, right? There is a physical closeness and an intimacy that cannot be replaced, right? And... Um, I remember my very first encounter with the presence of God. Uh, and this was like way back when I was actually a young boy studying in, in primary school. I'm not sure what it is called here. Is it uh, elementary or is it the same? Same, primary school. So I, I remember I was just in primary two. So I would have been like uh, eight, eight or 10 years old. And um, so I, st I come from a Catholic school. Right? It was a Catholic school, and so ever so often they would have mass, Catholic mass, and it's and it's pretty much like a a Sunday service, right? But it's um, they they have their own format and stuff like that, and so every student has to uh, be part of it, and so they would have mass, and I remember during one of those times during Easter, you know, we would celebrate or commemorate Good Friday. Uh, and, and Easter Sunday. And so during one of the Mass, I remember one of the, in fact, our discipline master of all people, the discipline master who strikes fear into every heart, he came up and he started leading worship. Right? And, and so I wasn't a Christian then. right? So it was all quite new to me. But then this discipline master came up and he told us to, as he led worship at the front, right? he told all the students, all right, he went, everybody close your eyes. All the students closed their eyes and he, and he started, you know, uh, leading this song called As the Deer. You know that song? As the deer panders for the water so much so long after you. So, you know, uh, of course he didn't sing this nice. But, <laughs> but so as he was leading his song, <laughs> as, he was, as he was leading the song, um, you know, he told us, <clears throat> he told all the students, you know, 
close your eyes and imagine that Jesus is in front of you. Imagine that you're singing to Jesus, right? So, so I did that, you know, like primary two, very, very good boy, very obedient. So I listened, you know, and, I, and it was in that moment that I really felt the presence of God. You know what I felt? I felt I was sitting way back at the hall, but what I felt, I felt as if like Jesus literally walked on stage. Oh, it's okay. I have water here. <laughs> Double, thank you. Um, so I felt as if literally the person walked on stage. And, and that was my very first encounter of the presence of God. And I could, you know, even till now, right, I, thank you, thanks. I have so much water here. <laughs> uh, till this day, you know, I never forget what it felt like to feel like almost the physical presence. And wouldn't it be like pretty awesome if like during our Sunday services, even just in our gatherings, like the physical presence of Jesus actually walked among us. And I want to leave this with you. You know, if there's one thing that you guys cannot uh, remember about what I shared this morning, if there's one thing, is this thing I want you to remember, is that one of Jesus' deepest desires is that He longs to be with you. Jesus Himself desires and longs to be with us, to make His dwelling among us. Right? In John 17, 24, it says... Uh, this is, you know, in John 17, uh, Jesus prays for his disciples and he also prays for the unbelievers. But as he makes this prayer, right, imagine that as someone, you, are, you know that this is your last few moments and that you are spending. And, and Jesus actually prays this long prayer, you know. And, and, you know, for Jesus, he's the son of God. He pretty much has everything, right? He's king over the universe, and so, you know, he's, Jesus is kind of the, like the person that if, uh, you know, you had to buy a birthday gift for, like you really don't know what to buy because he owns everything. And if there's one thing that Jesus actually said he wants is this. He, he actually prays this prayer right before he goes to be crucified on the cross. He says, Father, I desire, Father, I desire those you have given me to be with me where I am. So Jesus is actually communicating his desire to be with his people. And if you knew what was on Jesus' heart, if you knew what his desire w- was, would we not actually respond to that and give him what he desires? Is that he, is that he would have a people who would love his presence, that he would have a people who would love to, to commune with him and have fellowship with him. And he wants to be in our meetings. He desires to be in our services. You know, he... he he doesn't want us to just come on a Sunday morning, learn a few scripture, do some Bible study, and, you know, and be happy that we learned something new from the Bible. You know, he wants us to experience and encounter Him. He wants to be in our conversations. He wants to be in your most difficult moments. In your victories, He longs to be with you. And so this shows me how much Jesus actually loves to be with His people. And whether or not are we actually aware of that? Are we aware and awakened to the fact that Jesus desires to be with us on an individual level, but corporately as well? You know, there are two levels to the presence of God. And I just want to quickly share this. One is His omnipresence and the other is His manifest presence. When we talk about the presence of God, right? The omnipresence of God, it means that God is everywhere all at once. King David himself writes in Psalms 139, he says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? Right? So there is the omnipresence of God where Jesus is, where, where God is everywhere, all at once, and he's all-knowing. Then there is his manifest presence, which means God actually makes himself known or felt by some way, shape, or form. In the Old Testament, you know, he appeared to his people in a cloud. He appeared to Moses in a fire, in a burning bush. What if God, one of these days, actually appeared to us as a pillar of fire in our service? That would be so cool. When God appears in a room, sometimes, you know, we can feel it because when God appears, the atmosphere starts to shift. We feel an awakening in our hearts. 
right? And the difference between the omnipresence of God and the manifest presence of God is really how aware are we? How aware are we of His presence? When we begin to shift and turn our focus and turn our attention and affection on Jesus, right? We begin to feel Him revealing Himself. When God manifests His presence, it means that He is revealing His person, He's revealing His, His character in the midst of us, amongst His people. And so, yes, it's true sometimes, you know, when we come to Sunday service and, you know, we, we, we love to use the term, you know, we invite His presence, we welcome His presence. Uh, well, yeah, some people have issue with that because technically He's everywhere. You know, it's not that we have to ask Him to come in through the door. But the way that we use that term is just more of, hey, are we actually aware that, and are we actually turning our affection and, 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 and asking Him, Lord, come and make Yourself known among us. Come and make Yourself felt among us. Because we don't just want, you know, to have a, have a gathering that's actually about Jesus, but without Jesus in our midst. And that's really what we want, and that's really what the manifest presence of God is about enough. And I feel like one of the things that He's reminding us is that have we continually, you know, practiced that love for His presence? Or have we fallen into, you know, a pattern or like a place where we've gotten used to the way that service is run? As long as we have music, as long as we learn something from the Word of God and we get prayed for, you know, we can happily live and go about our day. See, when God comes into the room, there is power and our hearts and our spirits come alive. He wants to bring new life and new rivers into our midst. There are two people in the Bible that, that love the presence of God that, um, that I have been so impacted by as I read you know, their accounts in the Bible. The first of them is Moses, right? In Exodus chapter 23, uh, chapter 33, sorry, it says, Moses says to God, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. Oh, sorry. If your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? So here is a man, Moses, whom the Bible says God actually spoke to face to face as if with a friend. Moses has seen the hand of God, right? Splitting the sea, the Red Sea, so that the Israelites could cross. Moses saw the miracles that God could do. And in fact, he saw the manifest presence of God, right? It's said that his presence actually rested uh, in, the, in the tabernacle above the Ark of the Covenant. And Moses would spend hours and days before the presence of God. And so Moses, his heart, he knew the presence of God. And then when it came a time when God actually said, because of the disobedience of his people, like God was willing to let the people of Israel into the promised land, but he said his presence will not go. And this I love this response by Moses because it reveals the priority of, of Moses' heart. Moses actually said, God, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us out from here. And it's a, it, it's, it's a revelation for me because do we actually realize that God sometimes can give you the desires of your heart and answer the prayers of your heart, but He may not actually be with you. He may not actually go with you. He can give you the victories and He can give you, you know, uh, the, the dreams and the visions that you pray for and you ask for. But it is, not, it is not a given. We can actually take for granted that actually Jesus, He sends His blessings, but it, doesn't, it does not mean that His presence actually goes with us. And that's a scary thought. Because sometimes God can answer our prayers without actually saying that I, I would love to journey through this with you. Moses values the presence of God so much that he tells 
God, if you're not coming with us, I don't want to go. And essentially, Moses is saying, I'd rather be lost and stuck in the desert than to enter into the promised land without the presence of God. And in the following, you know, he says, unless you go with us, what will distinguish me and your people from all of the other people on the face of the earth? And this is a huge statement because Moses is actually saying, without the presence of God, you know that our gathering, our, you know, coming together in our people, it's just like any other gathering. It's like any other social gathering, any other religion, if I can say. And if we don't have the presence of God in our meetings, we're no different, you know, to how other people are practicing their, their, their religion. We're no different from back then, the way that the pagans practice their religion. In fact, we're no different from any social club. No different from any clubs at night, people who dance and to sing to music. So the only thing, right, the only one thing that sets us apart is that the presence of God is with us. Moses valued the presence of God more than anything in the world because Moses understood that the reward and the prize is not blessings or of the promised land, but having God himself. The reward and the prize is having God himself, his presence actually with us. The second person that, that really impacted me with his story is David. And it says um, in Psalms 27, for one thing I desire, one thing that I will seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. David was a young boy, you know, probably you know, 16 or 17 when he was a shepherd boy and he was anointed to be king. And he loved to worship the Lord and to sing in his presence. David was a worshiper. And, and one of his most famous psalms is this psalms that I just read. If we track the life of, of David from him becoming a shepherd, from him being a shepherd boy all the way to becoming king over all of Israel, Right, we realize that he had so many things. He, was, he had literally access to the kingdom. But yet David wrote these psalms and he said, one thing that I seek. You know, we can have so many things in life and these days, uh, you know, it's so easy to actually just open up our phone, go on to Shopee and buy anything that we need. Recently, I've, I've you know, uh, been buying stuff online because, you know, I just got, I, I recently just got married about a month ago and... Oh, she's here, by the way. My wife is there. <laughs> the one who just served me water. <laughs> um, there's so many options for us. So many things available online, right? It's so easy. And, and sometimes I have to uh, tell myself like, oh, okay, like, you know, uh, just track budget, like not overspend. <laughs> and recently, I, I had to look for new shoes, right? Because uh, my old shoes, I, I had worn it for like at least two years and a hole began to like, uh, appear at the bottom of my sole. So every time it rains and I walked out on the road, like, my socks would get wet. And it makes me wonder, God, you know, if you can do the miracle for like, the Israelites where they wild wandered in the wilderness 40 years and their sandals and their shirts um, um, never got bad, like, why, why didn't you do for my shoe? But it's okay. <laughs> but I, I, um, I had to look for... Yeah, in, in short, I had to look, look for a pair of new shoes and I remember actually I was here in JB and I came to one of the stores at one of the malls and I thought to myself like, okay, like, you know, I'll look for a pair of shoes, uh, one that, you know, like, like I like and, and it's been reasonable budget, you know. So I went to the sport shop, uh, the shoe shop and went to look for shoes and I thought, let's try something different. And, you know, I tried so many and like I looking at the prices and started comparing here and there, go to different shops. Well, actually, it's quite a chore you know, to actually look for a, a good pair. And you know what? In the end, I, I ended up buying the exact same pair of shoes, which is a Nike Air Force One. Um, because I realized that when I wore it, it's like, oh, right, it's the most comfortable and I'm, I, I'm the most happy with this pair of shoes. So it was so funny that the entire process, I ended up with the same pair uh, of shoes. You know, there's so many things out there that, that uh, it is available for you to actually get. Um, there's this very popular brand also, uh, I'm not too sure about here, but in Singapore, called Beyond the Vines. 
uh, it's like a really popular bag and, and a lot of uh, ladies uh, buy this bag and there is this bag called the dumpling bag. It's essentially a bag that looks like a dumpling. <laughs> and then they have these uh, puffer bags and stuff like that. And every bag comes in like every color available. And, and, and like people, they, don't, they can't only get like one dumpling bag, they need to get all of the colors. Like so many things to buy. And, and then recently also because, uh, you know, we, we got married and then we had to look for a house. So we got a flat and, and we're getting the flat in about three months time. And, you know, there's so many things, a whole list of things that we have to buy for the house, right? Appliances. Uh, and I'm sweating just thinking about how much we have to spend to get like the refrigerator, <laughs> the oven and stuff like that. Um, so many things, so many things in life to, to get. And, and, you know, there's actually a psychological phenomenon called uh, the paradox of choice. The paradox of choice. We think that in the age that we live in, you know, we have, we have a whole list of things that we can choose from. Different brands. You know, we just need to take our phone out and Google and we can compare prices and things like that. We go to supermarket. Nowadays, like, you go there, um, like, just certain thing, right? Just the other day, Sarah was trying to buy, like, oats. Oat, and then, like, 50 over choices to choose from, right? Um, we think that being presented with multiple options actually makes it easier to choose one that we are happy with. We think that being presented with multiple options actually makes it easier to choose one that we are, happier, that we are happy with and thus, uh, and thus increase our sense of satisfaction, right? Consumer satisfaction. Wow, you know, I get to choose so many options. Um, <clears throat> but actually... Uh, but actually having an abundance of options actually requires more effort to make a decision, right? Just like my shoe. And, and it can actually leave us feeling more dissatisfied with our choices. We think that having more options, we will be happy. But the truth of the matter, and psychologists have done this test, right? They've done their research, is that what it has resulted in is a generation who are dissatisfied with their choices. Because when you get something, you're always thinking, oh, maybe I should have gotten that. That might have been better. You know, I get the, the middle range. Maybe I should have spent a bit more to get the higher range. And we are left with a generation of people whom are never satisfied. There is always a gap. In fact, it makes us so difficult to make our choices. And, and the psychologists, you know, they, they say this, that, it, sh it has shown that there is more harm done to our psychological and emotional well-being. When the number of choices increase, so does the difficulty of knowing what is best. Instead of increasing our freedom to have what we want, the paradox of choice suggests that having too many choices actually limits our freedom. And so when I reflect on that and I'm thinking, here is a king who has access to the entire kingdom and he says one thing that I seek. And he resolved in his heart, say one thing I desire. He puts aside all desires and says the one thing I want is to be in the presence of the Lord day and night. And we've got to understand that, you know, David was not saying that the only one thing that he wants to do is go into church and worship the Lord 24-7. That's not what he's saying. David, we have to remember that he, he wasn't a full-time minister. He was actually a king. It meant that he, he was running a kingdom. He was running a government. There would have been tons of things for him to attend to. He was a busy man. But yet, you know, in his, in his Psalms, the way that he expressed his heart, the way that he expressed it, what was his priority, his one thing was to be in God's presence was that he would ever continually be in his presence. What would it look like if we had a generation? What would it look like if we, as the generation, committed and say that we only desire one thing? And what we desire is Christ in our lives. And I feel like there is an invitation for us, an invitation for us today to say, Jesus, I want your presence. I only want you. You are worth it all. I can have all the things in life. 
But all these things don't matter if I don't have the presence of God. If I can't have the presence of God. And I'm going to close with this passage in, in Revelations. I'll ask the team to come up and we, we're going to spend some time praying as well. And, is this, and it's in this passage in Revelations 2. And this was, this was a letter that was written by the Apostle John. And he saw in a vision, he saw in a vision the angel of the Lord sent by Jesus telling him to write these letters to seven churches in Revelations. And the very first church that John writes to is the church in Ephesus. And this was what he had to say to the church in Ephesus. He says, I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. And this is an overwhelming statement that Jesus actually speaks to his church through the angel of the church of Ephesus. And you know, the church of Ephesus was thriving and growing church. If you think about what, <clears throat> if you think about what we think is the model church, right? it's a church that, that does missions. It's a church that Is a church that has persevered through persecution, a church that has loved the Lord, a church that has kept true to his doctrine, kept true to who the person of Jesus is, the doctrine of salvation, and so on and so forth. We think about what the model church is, we think about you know a church. A church that has, that has endured the difficult times and have not grown weary, but kept the faith in journeying together. And the church of Ephesus was as such. You know, this was not a lazy church. This was a church that had programs. This was a church that, was, that had cultural impact in, 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 in this area called Ephesus. And this was a growing church. It was an affluent church. In fact, the area of Ephesus was a place of wealth and affluence. Like it was a trade, it was a it was a seaport, and so there were a lot of trade happening in this area. And so, as a church, they were wealthy, they were affluent, and they were reaching these influential people. And the angel of the Lord says to this church, "Say, I know your deeds. You've been doing so well. You have been." You know, you have been preaching the word. You have been preaching the gospel. You have been doing missions. You have been reaching society. You have been reaching your communities. You have persevered in your faith. And, in, and, and, and Jesus says, well done to this church for doing all of these things. But there's one thing that Jesus held against this church. And it was this thing, that they have forsaken their first love. It's scary to think that we can be a church, and I'm, just, I'm, and I'm not just referring to, to us, FGC, this morning, but the body of Christ. Like, we can be a church that are thriving in our society. And we think that we, we reach the level and the, and the marks and, and the standards of success in the eyes of humanity, and we think that we are doing well as a church. But yet Jesus sometimes can come lovingly in His mercy and kindness and reminds us you have forsaken your first love. And so I feel like this morning, there is an invitation for us to come back to love the presence of God. And we give thanks for the Lord. Again, like, 
you know, the wonderful stories that I heard uh, Nigel sharing last night about how the Lord has led this church. And understand that we're all on a journey. We're all on a journey together. But let us never forget to come back just to the simple daily practice of loving the presence of God in our lives. And so I want to take a moment to, to pray for us. I want to take a moment for the Holy Spirit to allow the Word of the Lord just to sit in your heart, just to settle in your heart. Whether you are 50 years in the faith or whether you are new, your first time here today, God is knocking at the door of your heart and He is inviting Himself and He's saying, I desire to walk with you. I desire to be with my people. Doesn't matter if we can have the best music, if we can have the best stage and, and, and conference hall and sanctuary, but without the presence of God, like it, amount, it all amounts to nothing. And so with every eyes closed, let our hearts just respond in this, in this tender moment of saying, God, we are returning to our first love. And the way that Jesus actually says this in Revelations, He says, consider where you have fallen. And so the key is this, going back to, to do the things we did at first. Do the things you did at first. What was it in the beginning? What was it like for you? Remembering and considering what was it like for you in the beginning? You know, as a new Christian, I remember, man, I, I, I was just so in love with, with the Word. I was reading Scripture every day. Didn't, it, it, it didn't matter if I, if I understood much of it or not. But just coming to that Word daily, reading, spending time even just in my bedroom, worshipping. What was it like at first? Coming back to that first love. So Father, I, I, I am asking God, would you reveal in our hearts and our spirits even now, if in any area, Father, we have forsaken our love, if in any, if at any moment or any time, any point, God, that church has become more about programs, if church has become more about numbers, and not just about church, but even our own personal Christian journey relationship with you, God, if it has come to nothing more than just duties, ticking the boxes, things that we have to do on a daily basis. God, if we have come to that place, Father, we ask God, would you, would you lovingly turn us back, help us come back to that first love, Lord. Help us realize, oh Lord, how much you desire to be with your people, how much you desire God that you would make that prayer before giving your life, God. You would make that prayer, Father, that you desire to be with us. And we pray, God, that we would be a generation just like David, just like Moses, who said, Father God, you can bring us to the biggest stadiums, Lord. You can bring us to the biggest places, to the most influential, the most affluent places. But if your presence does not go with me, God, I don't want to go. I only desire, Lord, to go where you go. Would we be like a generation of David who would say and choose the one thing? Would we be a people, a company of people that would model extravagant devotion and say, Lord, we choose only one thing, one thing that matters to me. And God, would we come back 
and return, Lord, to our first love. Not forgetting, God, the history that we have with you, just how far and how much of the blessings you have poured out. But at the same time, coming back to the first love that God, what we truly enjoy and what we truly seek, God, is to love you. It's to simply love you, God. With every eye closed, if your commitment today in responding to that invitation is God, coming back to my first love, renew my heart and my passion for you once more, God. Your prayer is to say, Lord, I'm responding to this invitation of saying, God, will you be my one thing in my life? Just want us to quickly just lift our hands. You can just be where you are, but just lift your hands to the Lord. As you make this response to Him, just saying, Father, Lord, my heart is for you, God. So I pray, Father, for every heart that's responding to you, that we will encounter your, your presence even on a deeper level. Lord, I'm asking and I'm prophesying that those hearts that are responding now, God, that they will begin to encounter you in fresh new ways that they have not before. Regardless of how long, Lord, they have journeyed with you, regardless of what position, or assignment or role they have in this church, God, they're going to encounter you in fresh new ways. Lord, I ask for a deepening of their connection with you, Lord. God, that, that, that there will be a renewed heart and passion for you. Thank you, God, that, that this church, that our gatherings here in FGC will be marked by your glory, will be marked by your presence, that we will be known as a people that loves your presence more than church that we will be your people who will love your presence more than the programs and the ministries that are here. Father, that we seek and desire one thing that's far greater, far worthier, that will bring the satisfaction that our hearts cannot know anywhere else. So I thank you, God. You're doing this new work among us, among your people, God. And as you sow these seeds in our heart, Father, let it, let it germinate, let it take root, God. Their hearts will come alive in your presence, God. Thank you, Lord. And I pray in us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.